stand with me as our Hallelujah. pastor is coming Hallelujah. up here. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is great. Please be seated. Please be Ooh, seated. Lord. Hallelujah. Wow. Today has been so awesome. Yes. Yeah. We used we've used a lot of time in praising God and I just love it. Yes. All right. Today's service is supposed to be a children's Sunday asking questions by the children. And um I don't know if the kids are ready for me. I'm ready for you. Bring your question from anywhere. If I can't answer it, I will dodge it. <laughs> I, have, I am so super ready for you guys. So somebody get the mics out. And uh, kids, if you have questions, please, you can ask. Just call for the mic. They'll bring the microphone to you. And you can ask your questions. Let's pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we thank you. Lord, we give you praise. We give you glory. Father, your word says, children are the heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is a reward. Father, your word tells us that when the children came unto you and the disciples were trying to put them away, you told them, no, let the children come unto me. Father, today, oh God, we want to listen to our children. We want to answer their questions, oh God. Lord, we ask, oh God, that you will give them the right questions. Open their ears, open their hearts, and Lord, give us even the right answers to give them. That your name alone will be glorified, and every one of us will be blessed. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right, I'm ready. Children, I'm ready. I'm ready. Keep thinking about your question. I got a couple of questions on your behalf already. But okay, is somebody over there ready for me? Absolutely. Go ahead, please, please. Don't be shy. No question is not, every question is reasonable as far as we're concerned, your kids. So, any question, you can ask any question. Okay, think, keep thinking, guys, keep thinking. While we're thinking, a couple of questions. You know that kids love to ask. Let me start with the question about this season that we're in Christmas. So is Santa real? Is Santa real? Is Father Christmas real? Is Santa real? Well, there are two answers to that. But the short one is Santa is not real. That's the short answer. Santa is not real. As far as I am concerned, Santa is a means of my children to take my money to go and see a man dressed in red and white. So for me, Santa is a commercial venture that has been used to make children take the money from parents, period. So Santa is not real. You know, so uh, I think that's the shortest answer you want me to answer you. But it is still okay to tell daddy and mommy, we want to go and spend your money. And then you go and look at the man in red and white. Even with beard. I'm growing my beard, so you don't need to go and look for the beard anymore. You can come and see pastor's beard. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so that, that, that's a good answer for that word. All right. So uh, my next question says, I'm waiting. When you're ready for me, just Flip up your hand, they'll give you a mic, and then we'll go from there. But while you're still thinking about your question, my next question says, what is God like? You know, the mind of a child works excellently. I'm telling you, they are sincere in their questions. What is God like? You know, the funny thing is, some of us adults don't know what God is like. Some of us just follow everybody to do what everybody is doing. But we don't know what God is like. Now, John, 1 John chapter 4 verse 12 says, No one has ever seen God. Let me establish that. Children, no man has seen God. Nobody. So if somebody tells you, oh, God is like this, that is that person's perspective. There is a scripture in the Bible, I believe in the book of Ezekiel. That talks about the four faces of God. 
a man came and said, Oh, God is like a lion. Because from the point of view that he looked, he saw the head of a lion. Another one came and said, No, 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 you are wrong. God is like an eagle. Because of the direction from which he was looking from. Another one said, Like a man. I've forgotten what the fourth one said, but they all had different opinions based on where they were looking from. But can I tell you something? God is everything they saw. Did you hear me? God is everything they saw. And the best answer to tell you what God looks like is the Bible tells us we are made in the image and likeness of God. So every time you look at yourself in the mirror, guess what? You are seeing the replica of God. Children, did you hear me? Every time you see yourself in the mirror, you are seeing a replica of God. That's who you are. Because we are all made in the image and in the likeness of God. So if somebody asks you, what is God like? Say, God is like me. That's the simple answer. God is like me because I look like him, period. Hello? Amen. Amen. All right, are you ready for me? I should still keep going. All right, I'll keep going. Now, the next question the child will ask you, who created God? After all, everything was created. So, who created God? Any child want to try and answer that for me? Who created God? Okay. Any of the parents want to dabble into that? I told you I'm not going to be the only one on the spot. <laughs> We're all going to be on the spot today. So, somebody better get ready to answer that. Who created God? Hello, please let me bring out the mic, please, and run around everybody. Somebody here said something first. Okay, Asha, go on. Um, nobody created God. Beautiful, awesome answer. So how come God exists if nobody created God? Hello, somebody saying something here. He created himself because he's all God by himself. Mm. Yes. Hallelujah. You know, let me read the scripture. Revelation chapter 1 verse 8. This is God speaking. It says, I am the beginning and the end. One translation says, I am the beginning without a beginning. And I am the ending that never ends. One, that's what a translation says. So God is the beginning. He starts all things, but he himself was not started. And when the time comes, he will end all things, but he himself continues. He never ends. And that's why we say we, he is the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. The first and the last. That's who he is. Hallelujah. So, nobody created God. He created himself. You know, actually, he did not even create himself. He exists. That's the best you see, because if you look at creation and you say something is created, then it started from somewhere. God has no beginning. So he just exists. That's it. He was not created. He exists. And out of his existence, he brought us forth. And he brought everything forth. Hallelujah. All right. Anybody else want to say something about Absolutely. I'm ready for you now. Why do people go to heaven? Sorry, please say it again. Why do people go to heaven? Why do people go to heaven? All right. Good time for some parent to answer that. Let me bring the mic out for one of the parents. If they will not, I will call them by name. Give mic to Pastor Nathan. Ask that question again. <laughs> Ask the question. Why do people go to heaven? Why do people go to heaven? Well, a short answer is it's a promise that God gave to those who chose to live for him and to receive Jesus as their personal savior. Huh? I think he's just asking the general question of why people go to heaven. Okay. Beautiful. Conversation has started. 
I like that. Okay. <laughs> Not everybody go to heaven. Hmm. So that question is either asking about death or life after death. Okay. So not everybody will go to heaven. Okay. Like Pastor Nathan said, not everybody that die will go to heaven. Like Pastor Nathan said, it's a promise for those that choose to follow the path of God and Amen. serve him. If they die, they will go to heaven. Amen. And so what's the alternative? So let's explain it fully. When people don't go to heaven, they go to hell. So what qualifies a person to go to heaven? What qualifies a person to go to heaven? Good works? Good life? Being friendly to everybody? What qualifies a person to go to heaven? Okay, I love the echo. But let's do it one at a time so the children can actually hear us. So let's start with Dickness Favor. Wait, they will give you the mic so everybody can hear you. When you receive Jesus in your life as your personal Lord and Savior and keep walking in his studies and obey him till the end, Okay. You go to when you die, you go to heaven. Okay. But what if Jesus comes before you die? Yes. And then if Jesus comes and you're still standing with the Lord, you're still obeying his statutes, then you go to heaven. Okay. Yeah. Pastor Nathan. The word says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, then you shall be saved. It's Amen. only by salvation that you can receive heaven. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. All right. Any other question? Following that, I'm coming to you, uh, Zion. Give me a minute. Following that, there is a question here that I have. What is heaven like? Since we're already on the topic of heaven. What is heaven like? Anybody want to try that? What is heaven like? Thank you. Daniel? Oh, okay. Okay, you're still uh, thinking. I think heaven is like, uh, you, got, you, see, you get to see God for the first time. Uh, you get to see other people in heaven. I think there's a water fountain in heaven. Oh, yeah. Hey, innocent mind. Water fountain in heaven. Yes. <laughs> yes. You see other people in heaven. Yes. Innocent mind. Thank you, Daniel. Any other person, what is heaven like? No, she's not lifting up her hands. Any of the parents want to help us there? Pastor Emmy, you want to? Okay. Heaven is paradise and everything you could ever ask for. Heaven is paradise and everything we can ever ask for. I love that. That's awesome. But you know, I won't say everything we can ever ask for. Because there are some things we ask for that we will not see in heaven. There are some things, you know, we, we ask for it, but we will not see them in heaven. <laughs> no matter how much we ask. Hallelujah, Pastor. Heaven <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, is a beautiful place. Mm. Um, <clears throat> it's uh, the dwelling place of God himself, full of light, yes. full of beauty. Uh, there, there's a lot of things there that is being described. Just, mm. uh, just a fraction of that. We have the gleams of that here. Just imagine, uh, you go to some places and how beauty is being decorated or decked around. Mm. Uh, heaven is more than that. It's a beautiful place. Amen. Amen. Now let me help you. Okay. Okay. Just like what everybody has said, um, it's. Like Pastor said, it's a beautiful place, and the Bible says that its streets are made of gold. Mm. So it's you can imagine gold everywhere in heaven is gold, and also the Bible says it's a place where he pre, he has prepared a mansion for everyone. Then if you goes there, you have your own mansion. Can mm. you imagine that? It's also a place where the angels worship God 24/7. If you go to heaven, you worship God 24/7, and only. The ones who made it, who had Christ in their lives, 
who kept the statutes of God, who obey God till the end, either through rapture or they die and they go to heaven. That's how heaven looks like. Amen. It's like you communicate through worship, worship 24-7 non-stop. Amen. Amen. Pastor Rani? Heaven is the throne of God where believers on earth, when, we, when they die, they live forever. Yes. It's not a place that has an end. Yes. It's a place that has no end mm -hmm. with all the beauty that has been described. And God is the one that rules and reigns in heaven. He's the one in charge. But we all rule with him and we all reign with him forever. Amen. So when, we, when people translate to heaven, it's an everlasting place. Amen. I love that. Now to help the mind of the little children, walk with me a little bit from the Bible this morning. Revelations chapter 7 verse 16. The Bible says, on each side of the river grew a tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit and fresh crop each month. And fresh crop each month. So in heaven, guess what? We eat delicious food. Hello, children. Are you listening to me? In heaven, we eat fresh fruits. Not uh, the inorganic GMO fruits that they sell for us on earth. We eat natural fruits because the Bible says they grow. Hallelujah. So we eat delicious meal in heaven. Number two, let's go to Re Revelation 5, 11. It says, then I looked, I looked again, and I heard singing of thousands and millions of angels around the throne. Heaven is full of singing and worship. Children, are you hearing me? Heaven is full of singing and worship. Did you hear that? Thousands and millions of angels singing and praising. That's the company of those we're going to join when we get to heaven. And we'll just be singing. Just imagine it. A beautiful life where we're just singing and worshiping 24 hours. We take breaks to eat, you know, to relax. And then we come back and we continue. We're not thinking about the bills. We're not thinking about growing old. We're not thinking about changing our clothes and looking beautiful. Because in heaven, we are already beautiful. Hallelujah. All right. Number three. Revelation chapter four, verse three. Uh, four, four, verse six first. And the glow of an emerald circled is thrown like a rainbow. And in verse 3 it says, And the angel showed me a pure river with water of life, clear as crystal. Hallelujah. Can you imagine the beauty of heaven? The beauty. You know, I think it's only it's in the Bahamas that you see a clean, a, clean, a clean seashore. You know, imagine in the whole of heaven, every river is clean. Every river is like an aquarium. You see through and it is beautiful. It says it's like crystals. Do you understand? So heaven is a beautiful place. Number four, the light of God's love is always shining in heaven. In Revelation chapter 22 verse 5, it says, Its gates never close at the end of the day because there is no night. Woo. There is no night. We don't need light. That was Revelation um, Chapter 22, verse 5. It says, its gates never close. You know, when we're going to bed now, we have to lock our doors. Is that not so? Turn off some lights. But in heaven, it is ever bright. Tell your neighbor, it's ever bright. We don't sleep. We don't snore. No, 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 no. Hello? We, we are perfect. Tell your neighbor, we are perfect in heaven. Everybody is perfect and we're just worshiping because heaven is a beautiful place. There is no gate there, no security guard, no policemen, no bad people in heaven, no guns in heaven. Hallelujah. A very peaceful place. Hallelujah. One more and then we'll go to the next question. You know what? I love this one. Uh, the Kinesi River said it. Uh, Everybody has a mansion. 
You know, many years ago, a man preached and he said, God said everybody had gets a mansion. But he said, look, if everybody gets a mansion, then that means some people will get boys' quarters. Some people will get a uh, dormitory. Some people will get, well, I just made it to heaven. He says, so what we do on earth determines what we get in heaven. If you walk for the mansion, you will get a mansion. But if you walk for face me, I face you, you will get a face me, I face you. If you walk for just a bed, you will get a bed in heaven. That, I didn't say that. That person said that. But it may be true. Because the Bible tells us we receive crowns. And I want to assume that if we do in the, if, when we receive those crowns, it qualifies us for more benefits when we get to heaven. So the more we do for God, the more the benefits we get when we get to heaven. Hallelujah. Lastly, everyone in heaven can run, can walk, can dance, can sing. The Bible says here in Isaiah 40, 31, it says the people of God will sing a song of joy. That's Isaiah 30, 29. The people of God will sing a song of joy. And then in 40, 31, it says, those who wait on the Lord. Remember, heaven is where God is. It says, they will find new strength. They will fly high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint in heaven. There will be no fainting in heaven. You can run a hundred miles in one day and you won't faint. Can you imagine? Wow. Heaven is beautiful. Hallelujah. All right, I'll take your question now, Zion. What is the, the book of life? What is the book of life? I love that. I believe one of our parents can answer that. If your name is written there, the child wants to know. Ah, the book of life. Okay. Okay. Somebody else want to try the book of life. The book of life. Where your name is written. <laughs> Pastor Yemi. Oh, Pastor Dupe. Okay. Yeah, he brought the phone mic to somewhere good. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The book of life. Listen. Is, is where uh, for every believe, everyone that gives their life to Christ, the book of life is where their names are written. And so when we get to heaven, whether by death or if we're still alive and Jesus comes and we go to with him, then the, that book will be opened to find everybody's name. And that is everyone that has given their life. And those that do not have Christ, their names will not be in that book. Praise the Lord. Amen. That's simple. You see, the book of life is like, listen, listen. When you get to school in the morning, what will, what will your teacher do? Roll call to check those who are in class. Is that not so? Also in heaven, there will be a roll call. If your name is not found in that book of life, you do not qualify to be in heaven. It's that simple. So your name has to have been written in the book of life in order for you to be a particle of heaven. Praise the Lord. Nice one. Well, if you die at an old age, are you going to stay in heaven at that old age? I love that. And I'll answer you quickly. Whether you are old or young, see, this body, let me explain something. This body that I have, that you have, is like the jacket you're putting on, is like the clothes everybody's putting on. When we die, this body stays on earth. Everybody receives a terrestrial body. You know, it's like when people go into space, can they go into space with this body? No. They have to have space suit on to go into space. You understand? So on earth, this is the, this is the earthly suit that we can use while we're here. But when we die and we go to heaven, that's why when a person dies, what happens? They bury the body. But the spirit man goes back up. The spirit man receives a terrestrial body. A body that is not like this body. A body that is perfect. It receives an heavenly body. And so nobody grows old or nobody is young in heaven. Everybody is the same. 
Do you understand me? Everybody is the same. The beauty of it is, even though we are the same, we all have that same body, the power of recognition is given to every one of us. Even, though, you know, if I look at the clothes I'm putting on now, if I go and change these clothes, will you still recognize me? No matter how many times I change my clothes, my figure remains the same. Likewise in heaven, we will recognize each other, but we will not be old and we will not be babies. We will all be at the same level. Praise the Lord. Amen. Huh? Age-wise, yes. Because they don't grow old in heaven. Next question. Do you defeat sin? Woo! Awesome. The number one answer is by accepting Jesus into your life and into your life. That's the number one way you can defeat sin. The Bible says it is not by power, it is not by might, but by the Spirit of the living God. Once you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and the Holy Spirit comes into your life, guess what? It begins to give you directions and instructions of things to do, things to avoid. If you notice, everybody that falls into sin, it is always, for everybody, no exception, as a result of disobedience. We fall into sin when we disobey either a commandment of God or an instruction of the Holy Spirit. When we are at the wrong place, at the wrong time, with the wrong people, then we're going to fall into sin. But when we are at the right place, at the right time, with the right people, doing the right things, then we will not be able to fall into sin. Let me, let me put it this way. In church now, right now, is it easy for you to fall into sin? I didn't say, is it possible? I said, is it easy for you to fall into sin amongst every one of us? Because we are in the right place, at the right time, with the right people, doing the right things. Do you understand? So, the best way to defeat sin is the Holy Spirit, your name uh, written in the book of life, the Holy Spirit grows in your life. You see, the, the larger the Holy Spirit grows, the lesser sin dies, the lesser sin becomes. But if you don't grow the Holy Spirit, then sin grows. Something is always growing in us. Either the Spirit of God or sin. Something is always growing. So if one is not growing, the other is dying. Sorry, if one is growing, the other is dying. It's that simple. So when you find yourself leaning more towards sin, then the Holy Spirit is dying slowly on your inside. I hope I've been able to answer that. Help me. Thank you. We also can overcome sin by reading the Word of God. Amen. You know, when we, by constantly reading the Word of God, because when we read the word of God, we know what God says, we know what God wants, and it helps us to check ourselves. That when we're doing, when we're going the opposite direction, we know that's not what the word of God says, so we can caution ourselves and get back. So I, I believe when we know God, we will be able to overcome sin. And the Bible says, we are all men in the flesh. Nobody is above sin. So we should not think, oh, some people don't sin. The Bible says everybody sin. Everybody sin. Whether you're a pastor, whether you're a preacher, whether you're a child, whether you're a parent, everybody sin. And we sin daily. But when we know the word of God and when we sin, we repent of it. It says God will forgive us. First John 1 John 1.9, that's what it says. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and is just to forgive us all of our sins and to cleanse us from every unrighteousness. Okay, the, qu the question was, why do we sin? No, it says, how, how do we do defeat, we defeat sin? sin? We defeat sin because it says in the Bible, we lack due to knowledge. What's that, what's that passage? It says, you ask not and you receive not, because you ask amiss, 
but there's one that says we lack, we perish due to the lack of knowledge. So, yes, so we perish, meaning we, we die, we fall short, we make bad mistakes, we listen to the wrong people, we follow the wrong crowd, we may even do things that we have been told that are wrong and we should not do because we are lacking the knowledge of knowing what we are worth, knowing what we should be doing, knowing how we should do it on a daily basis, and we follow the wrong lead. So by knowing who you are, knowing what you want to do, not what you see others doing, because I find it so easy for us to make excuses to sin because everyone else is doing it, or it looks like it's something that no one else is going to know, or someone else is going to um, excuse because they make excuses. They try to critique the Bible and the word according to how they want it to sound to themselves so that they're able to do these things that make it okay in their eyes. But God's word never changes. It's always the same. Sin amounts to death. And if you're going to follow the word, you, we're not saying be perfect. You're not going to be perfect. But the lack of knowledge of knowing why you're doing what you're doing, and nowadays people are finding it to be mental health. They're using the excuse of mental health and other excuses. But what we need to do is stay educated on what's going on in our lives, why we're doing what we're doing in our lives, and stay attentive to who we allow in our lives so that we don't have to make these excuses to be in these sinful situations. Like you said, we are here. Is it hard for us to sin here? Yes, but in your mind, if you're not thinking that you're here and you're thinking somewhere else, you could be sinning sitting right here. So let's be very knowledgeable about what God has given us, the tools he's given us, the people that he's given you in your life, that you are able to utilize them and everything that you need to be as productive as you can be in your life so that you don't feel like someone took advantage of you, someone caused you to be in sin, someone um, made you do something because people don't make you do anything. You do it because you thought you can get away with it. However, just know we, we, we perished due to the lack of knowledge and I don't want to see anyone going the wrong way, but we're not perfect. Amen. Amen. Pastor Nathan. Okay. Okay, um, a simple definition according to James 4 and 17, it says, He that knoweth to do good and do it not is counted unto him as sin. And so when you know the right thing to do, you've been taught the right thing to do, you know the right thing to do, and then you choose to, to do something else, then that's sin to you. So the... Sin, um, defeating sin begins with a choice. The first choice is to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Second choice is to ask for the Holy Spirit to come inside of you, to live with you, to lead you, and to guide you into that all that truth that um, Deaconess is talking about, where you're, where you're taught of the Father, you're taught of the Holy Spirit. And then you have to make a personal choice within yourself when the opportunity comes. And opportunity comes to all of us daily, moment by moment, second by second. And at that moment, you make a choice. Your mama said, don't touch that cookie in the cookie jar. And you look around, mama's not there, daddy's not there. You know the right thing to do, but what choice am I going but it's just calling me. <laughs> she knew I wanted it. If it wasn't for her putting it in that jar, I would not have to go in that jar and take it. And then you make the choice and take it. Now the Bible considers that to be sin unto you. Uh, that's a two-part um, question for me. Because for one, number one, we have to allow to piggyback on what Pastor Nathan was saying, we have to allow the Holy Spirit to govern us. Just as our mind governs our body, the Holy Spirit governs our minds. So we have to allow that to take place. And then anything that comes to us in life, whether it be right, wrong, or indifferent, we do it three times before it's actually committed. Because first we think about it, it becomes a thought. And then we allow that thought to set in us and become 
something we dwell on until it overpowers us and then the final act, we do it. So we have three different steps where we can turn from that. And the second part of that question is, is spiritual. God detests sin. Sin is detestable unto God. God cannot look upon sin. So when we become saved and we take on his spirit, God sees us in, through Jesus Christ, in his spirit. That's how he sees us. So that's why God's forgiveness of our sins is because he knows what we're going to do before we ever do it. It's not that he don't know. He's waiting on us to know. Because in the Bible it says no man knows his heart knows what's in the heart. So when we say we know what we'll do, I never do that, or this won't happen to me, we're telling a lie because we don't know until that time gets there, yes. until we are faced with that battle. And then that brings the final thing into fruition, which is the battle is not ours. It's the Lord's. So no matter what we go through, no matter where we find ourselves at, no matter what we do, that's why it says there ain't nothing we can do, nothing we can do to surprise or shock God because he already knew. He's waiting for us to then ask for forgiveness of that thing and to purify our hearts and create a, do, a clean spirit in us. So that's the way that is. We have to allow the spirit to govern us. Amen. Brilliant. Uh, just okay. <laughs> just, just one more thing. It, it's also important to not deceive yourself. Mm. There's not one sin that you've committed in your life that you didn't know it was wrong when you did it. That's right. That's the pure nature of sin is you already knew it was wrong and you decided to do it anyhow. Amen. So let's not deceive ourselves. Amen. Pastor, sorry. Yeah. Um, and I think... Uh, <clears throat> The other thing we, we need to keep in mind is, uh, is this. We have to take a stand against it because there are preventions, uh, preventive measures that God has given us. When you're walking towards disobedience, if you notice, there's a land that goes on within you. It's, to some, it's either you're having headache. To some, it's like your heart is really palpitating that tells you is is a signal that it is wrong and you shouldn't go there i'll give you an example we all know the street that we drive some speed says 25 some says 35 some says 45 we know those things but some of us intentionally and deliberately we just drive if it's 25 you drive 45 or 50. The moment you sight the police, what happens to you? No, not even slow down. Your heart just goes up. Now you're asking God to have mercy on you. So like, like Pastor Nathan, like Pastor Nathan said, no, that's the truth. Like Pastor Nathan said, we shouldn't deceive ourselves. We should not, you know? Uh, Brother Will said it well. Before those things happen, there are three stages. And God has given us what it takes to overcome those stages. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Okay. Yeah. At what age are they accountable? At every level. They know. For instance, you tell a child, okay, let's look at it. Let, let's, start, let's start from babies. Why do you think babies cry? When they cry the first time and you carry them and you give them food, right? The second time they cry, you give them food. So the baby immediately associates that if I want food, I better cry. Do you know that? And then another thing, attention. If the baby cries and you carry the baby, okay, that's nice. Then the second time he cries and you carry the baby. The third time, when the baby wants attention, baby will cry again. Because it has associated it. So, I believe as soon as a child begins to grow, 
they start knowing what is wrong and right for their level. Because what is wrong and right varies from different levels. What is wrong for a child, what is right for a child may be extremely wrong for an adult. Do you understand? So it's at different levels. So I believe every child is accountable from the day they can open their mouth. It's just that there are different levels of accountability. I'll give you an example. Many years ago, you know, we were serving in a ministry and um, this couple had a baby. They had their baby. And once the mother feeds the baby, changes the diaper, makes sure the baby is okay, puts the baby in the pram, takes the baby to the front of the altar and says, don't turn on the light, just leave the baby there. The baby starts to cry. And you know, we are concerned. We want to go there and she says, don't go near my baby. Said she will learn. I'm telling you. And the baby learned that if I cry, they're not coming for me. <laughs> they're not coming for me. So the baby learned to use that time to enjoy the sleep. But if you go and you carry the baby, the baby will associate that with that. Okay, when I cry, they're going to come for me. <laughs> Do you understand? So that's why I said at every level, a child is accountable. They, children who do bad things now, they know even before doing it. They know. Do you understand? So that's why that question, the answer is broad because we're talking about children. So for each level, there is accountability at every level. Baby, toddler, infant, uh, then the next stage, there is accountability at each level. And I was watching a, a, uh, a clip yesterday, and um, father and mother were in the house with their kids, and the little kid took a pin and went to the socket. And the mom jumped up, and father said, no, 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 leave him, leave him. Teachable moment. Hey, 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 I said I was watching a clip. <laughs> and the father said, teachable moment. Teachable moment. And the child put the pin and the house went black. And the father was laughing. He said, he will never do that again. <laughs> you know, but yeah, that was mean. But guess what? There are some teachable moments in life that you got to let them learn. You know? It's like when our parents will tell you, don't touch the hot stove. They will tell you once, twice, and the third time, they're going to make you touch it. And you will never go near that stove again in your life. Yes, please. <laughs> On that note, can we talk about then the grace that God has for us and that we should have for each other? Because nobody can tell me here that their Christian life or their journey to you know be with god has been smooth and easy and with no mistakes and so can we talk about that and oh yeah absolutely i think somebody said it already that we all sin there is now nobody i don't care whether you are the pope everybody sins that's why the Bible is so clear, I believe, in the book of Isaiah. It says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none that is perfect. No, not one. But the beauty of it is, as we walk with God, 1 John 1, 9 comes alive. The Bible says, he forgives our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us of all sins and to cleanse us from every unrighteousness. But he ask from is asking from us, confess that sin to me. If you know that it is wrong and you confess it, then you receive forgiveness. But if you play and say, well, it may not be sin, it is not sin, then you are not forgiven until you confess it. So I think that the grace is there when we miss it to repent. But we can misuse the grace by not repenting and living with it. Then we abuse the grace. 
So, but as far as I know, everybody misses it. Or oh, on a daily basis. Why do you think, I ask this question, why do you think Jesus was telling somebody, forgive your brother seven times, seven times, seven times a day? Your brother. Do you understand? That means that person misses it. What's the mathematics of seven times, seven times, seven? That means that person misses it 490 times in a day. Seven times, seven times, seven. 70 times 7 is 490. So if, if your brother misses it against you 490 times a day, guess what? You are missing it against somebody 490 times a day. And the Bible says you forgive your brother and then that person also forgives you. Do you understand? So the, the short answer is nobody is perfect. We all live by grace. It's only grace. Bible says, it is not of works of righteousness, lest any man will boast. It says, it's not of works of righteousness, lest anyone will boast. If you are doing well, it's because God's grace is upon you, period. It's, the, it's by his grace. You know, not because you're perfect. You know, I say this, the people who have died that God have called home, did they sin? Are we no they did not are we better than any of them no we are not we are still alive only by grace period nobody is perfect nobody if anything i believe they are better than us that's why god called them home do you understand so let's the, the i think that short answer is everybody misses it life is by grace period Okay, okay, any. <laughs> oh, if God is all knowing and he knows everything before it happened, why did he create people that are damned to hell? Hmm. I, will, I will start answering that question from the back. God did not create people that are damned to hell. No. We choose the route to hell. God created people that will make their own choice. That's who he created. And the reason why God created people who will make their own choice is God did not... I love this explanation from myself. In, angel, in heaven, what are the angels doing in heaven? They are in absolute obedience to God. They are doing everything like a machine. They are programmed and their programming cannot be changed. So God now wanted people that he can reason with. People who can choose, who can decide. People who can be like him. And so he made man. And that's why it is important to know that he made man in his own image and likeness. And he gave us the ability to choose. That's why he started in the Garden of Eden. God could have stopped Adam from eating that fruit by not planting that fruit there. But God had to let Adam and Eve make a choice. Because that is when fellowship is complete with God. When you choose to have that fellowship. Not when you are forced to have that fellowship. And so God gave them the opportunity to make a choice. And when they made the wrong choice, what did God do? God made a way to bring us back to him. And he used that as an example for us that look, they made a wrong choice, they missed it. Now that you're back to me, don't make that choice that they make. Do you understand? So God did not create man that was damned. No, 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 no. God created men that he wanted in heaven. And that's why the Bible says, God does not want the sinner to die, but he wants everyone to repent. Not one, but everyone, the whole world. John 3, 16 says it clearly. For God so loved the whole world that he gave his only begotten son. Now look at the clause. That whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. You see the choice there again? So God created us to choose and to fellowship with him. Praise the Lord. I think I tried. 
Pastor Nathan, yeah. This is a, a part B of that question that he asked, I think. Because there's some things in the Bible that alludes to what he's saying. So I want to bring up something. So um, Pharaoh, God said that he raised him up for a purpose. Judas, God used him for a purpose. Did they have choice? Um, like, 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 for instance, Pharaoh... Um, God told Moses to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And then the Bible says, and then God hardened Pharaoh's heart the more. Um, and, and so he wouldn't do it. Um, and then it, later it says. But he could do it. Go on. Could, and could, I will explain. Could he have done it if God already said that he already told Moses, Moses. That, that, he was, yes, he could. that he was not going to? Yes. Can I explain something quickly? When Pharaoh was made to fulfill that purpose, the opportunity for him not to go along that line were 10 miracles. 10. 10 solid opportunities. The, the, the biggest of them was the killing of the firstborn. He could still have stopped at the killing of the firstborns. But after a minute, he decided to pursue the Israelites. And that's when he was destroyed. So if you really look at it, he had 10 golden opportunities to turn things around. And likewise, when we fall into sin, like uh, Will said, we have opportunities to walk away before falling. So when we fall into sin, do we want to say that, oh, God created us so we could fall into sin? No. But it gives us the opportunity to walk away. But when we choose not to walk away, what happens? Boom. Another good example, Jabesh. He was named the son of sorrow. He could have lived his life as a son of sorrow. But at a point in time, he said, no, I'm not continuing this. I want a change. And he prayed, and he got his change. So that's why I believe strongly that even though God said, I raised him up for that purpose, he could... Now, look at every one of us. So do we want to say those in prison were raised up to be in prison? Choices were made. All of us make choices that moves us either towards or away from purpose. So if the purpose in our life is destruction, we can move away from it. Do you understand me? So there is that choice. That's what I want to establish. There is, we have the choice. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, the people of Nineveh, mm -hmm. where God sent Jonah that he was going to destroy them, they repented yeah. and God forgave them. And Jonah, Jonah didn't go because he said, I they know if these people repent, God, you're going to... Forgive You're going to forgive them. Yeah. So, yeah, even though, even um, Hezekiah, mm -hmm. you know, God said, You're going to die. And he said, God, please don't let me die. So, you, we still have that choice to bargain with God, and God will turn things around. Amen. Any? Did we try? Okay. Daniel. Oh, do. sorry. Before you do that, Will. Will's got something to say. Sorry, just hold on to your question. Is it a question or along the same line? Question. A question. Please, just hold on to it. We're still along the same line now. Yeah, I just wanted to share with uh, a thing to remember with Job. Job was a faithful man of God. And Satan came at Job only because he was so faithful. Yes. And we have to remember, when we go to God, Satan transforms himself into a marvelous light. Mm. And every time somebody goes to God, guess who shows up? The devil. The devil. Yeah. And he showed up and he said, Lord, you got a hedge around him. I can't get to him. Hmm. I can't do nothing with that man. You got him protection. Stop. And God gave him permission. You can do all you want. Just don't touch his life. So God knew how faithful Job was is what I'm trying to say. And he will not put no more on us than we can bear. Yeah. And Job lost everything he had, but he remained faithful. Amen. Even he told his wife, 
She said, curse, curse God, God and be done with it. He said, get me behind me, Satan. Not talking to her, but what was in her, because he knew Satan had come to try to get him to forsake God and for all these things of his kids and his land and everything else. Amen. All right, I think that settles that. Uh, Daniel, last question. So if you are in heaven and you act, if you do like a sin or you act bad, do you go straight to back to hell or do you stay in heaven? Okay, simple answer. In heaven, you cannot even sin. The thought cannot even come into your mind. Once, once you get to hev heaven, it's clean. There is no more thoughts of sinning. It doesn't even come up. Yeah, Lucifer had the opportunity also. The Bible said, if you read it in the book of Isaiah, it said, son of the morning, it was created excellent. Perfection was found in him until iniquity came. Do you understand? He just began, you know, imagine him praising God, worshiping God every day, every morning, every minute. And one day he just thought to himself, what if I'm the one sitting on that throne? That was the beginning of his downfall. And then he gathered a third of the angels of God and wanted them to worship and go along with him. And God banished all of them. And after that, no other Lucifer has risen up in heaven. <laughs> Hallelujah. Sometimes, some things happen so that we can have an example. It's not that God could not have stopped it, but so that we can have a good example why certain things must not be done. Praise the Lord. Okay. Oh, Zion. Okay. <laughs> His children. Anyway, uh, Mike, please. Yes. How would life have been if Adam and Eve did not disobey God? How would life have been? Ah, I would be living my best life. You know, imagine me just sitting under a tree. You know, I just pluck a ripe mango and I eat, you know, and I stroll. I just stroll. No, ah, perfect life. I'm telling you, very, very perfect. I go to the river. I see the fish I like. I don't have to get a hook. I just pick up the fish and it follows me. And I go and roast the fish. Oh, I'm telling you, life will be beautiful if Adam and Eve had not sinned. That's the short answer. Very, very beautiful. Amen. Okay. <laughs> huh? Isaac, you have a question? Okay, give him mic. Why does water go down the drain? Okay, well, you know, because it is water and because it has to flow somewhere, you know, you don't want to wash your hand and the water is dirty and it stays there. Do you want it to stay there? No, it's dirty. It's going to smell. It's going to stink. Mm. Mm? So you got to let it go down the drain and then so that you can have fresh water every time. Don't you like when water is fresh every time? Yes. So that's why dirty water goes down the drain. <laughs> okay, this, this question is a question that a lot of people that aren't in the faith ask. Is Jesus God? Amen. That question, where is it? Is my number four here. It says, how is Jesus God's son? Isn't he God too? So let's start from the basics. In Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, the Bible says in the beginning was God. And going further, it says, God said, let us. That means God was there in the beginning, but God was not alone. The fact that he used the word, let us. Let us create. That's, that tells us that there were some people with him. And then the Bible goes further. And God said, let there be, and there was. And the Bible said, and the spirit of the Lord hovered over the face of the earth. So three things exist almost immediately in Genesis. God, the words that he was speaking, and the spirit of God. And in John chapter 1 verse 1, Jesus said, the Bible says, 
um, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word is God. So that means the word that God spoke in the beginning was Jesus. And the Holy Spirit was the one that was hovering, doing the work. So three of them existed together then. Then when man sinned and God needed to save man, they had to, there had to be a means to save man that was not purely spiritual. It had to have the physical connotation that was required. And so the physical that was required was somebody had to go, one man, and take on the sin of man. God sent prophets. Men did not repent. Every other, th every other thing God tried did not work for man. God said, okay, use the blood of animal. It, the blood of animal could only cover, it could not wash away. You know, if I have a stain on my jacket and I put on, an, on, on my dress and I put on a jacket, you don't see the stain. But the stain is still there because I'm covering it. But if I take the jacket off and I wash it, bleach it, clean it, and the stain is removed, will you ever see a stain there? No. And that's why God decided we need one of us because no man was able to do this. And so Jesus said, I will go. What was he coming to do? The Bible says he was coming to take on himself the sin of the whole world. And so Jesus left heaven. And so they had to look for a physical way to bring Jesus to earth. And that's why the virgin birth happened. That's why Mary had to bring forth Jesus as a son, as a child. Not because he's the son of God. Jesus is God. But for our understanding and clarity, because he came as a man, that's why we say he is the son of God. So in heaven, the Trinity, God, the Father, God, the Son, God, the Holy Spirit, they exist as one. No difference. But for clarification for us as human, that's why we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So Jesus came, and that's why the Bible said, at a point in time in his life when he was on the cross, really the Bible said God turned his back upon him. The Bible says God could not look on him because he bore the sicknesses, the diseases of the world. He bore sin upon himself. I remember somebody said, God is so holy that he cannot behold sin. Even when Jesus took up, not his own sin, but our sin, God had to turn his back for three days. Until the throne of heaven was satisfied that the debt of man was paid. Do you understand? So I believe that's why. So Jesus is God. But for, un for the sake of understanding, we say Jesus is the son of God. And if you look at what we have in life, we've ha we have three dispensations. In the Old Testament, it was all about God the Father. In the New Testament, it was Jesus. After Jesus left, he said, I will give you a comforter. The dispensation of the Holy Spirit. So we've had the three dispensations of God in one. Himself in all the dispensations. But coming to us in a way that we can understand. Praise the Lord. All right. Ooh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> well, children, this is one question you love. Do, will, will our dogs go to heaven? Do animals... Oh, you have a question. Okay, I'll take your question before I answer that. Who was the first sinner in the Bible? The first sinner, Adam. Adam was the first sinner. After him, we took on his image. <laughs> Huh? It was <laughs> well, that's open to another uh, uh, argument. Uh, but we'll leave it as Adam. Because Adam is our father. So. Alright, so do dogs go to heaven? Somebody want to try yes or no? I just want a yes or no. I want, I want a controversy right now. You believe yes? Who else believe Yes. Yes. Dog owners are believing yes. Who else believes dogs don't go to heaven? Anybody say no, animals don't go to heaven. 
Okay. Ah, Will and Augustine say animals don't go to heaven. Who else? Ah, they don't. Ah, okay. See, see the argument. They don't, they do. It's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. We'll see now. Let me, let me, let, wait. Open your Bible to the book of Isaiah chapter 11 verse 6. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 6. And I want somebody to read. I'm not going to read. Somebody with a microphone, please read. Isaiah chapter 11 verse 6. Please use your mic. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together. And a little child will lead them. The Go to cow, the next one. Uh -huh. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together and the lion will eat straw like the ox. Thank you. Hello. Is that, that scripture, is it talking about anything in this world right now? It is. Uh, they are living together now. Animals are living together comfortably. They are not eating each other. <laughs> I don't know which world you're living in. <laughs> I don't know which world you, you're living in. We, hello, is that so? Do you all agree with me? The infant to play near the cobra. Hey, I see. I hear something today. Now, this is Isaiah prophesying about the heaven when the world is rolled back, rolled back. The new heaven. He says that that's the only place you can ever imagine this will ever happen. Why do we have the lion? The cobra. Why are they mentioning the names of animals here? So I believe the, the animals here, they will also be in heaven. That's my belief. Then let me, you know, let me, let me lay down, let me, let me settle it by reading what Billy Graham said. You know, there are some other scriptures, but I want to lay, I want to bring it home. Billy Graham said this, when a little girl asked the question, will my dog who died this week be in heaven? Billy Graham said, if it will make you any happier, then yes, it will be. Animals aren't as nearly as valuable as people, but God is their maker and has touched many people's lives through them. It will be simple for him to recreate a pet in heaven. I see no reason to believe he wouldn't if it will bring his children pleasure. So, I submit to that and I submit to the word of God. Pets will be in heaven. Ah. <laughs> when we get there, we will find out. That, quite, that answer, I don't know, Omar. <laughs> well, short answer, aren't there uh, cattle on a thousand hills? Ah, okay. thank you. All right. It says cattle on a thousand hills. Are there no hills in heaven? Have you been there? <laughs> the streets. Eh? So, are there no streets that have valleys in them and mountains on them? On earth? Yes, sir. <laughs> I think uh, to get more answers, go ahead and read Revelation. Uh, it exposes and expounds a lot of things that we should be expecting to see. Um, after this life. So Revelation is a very good place mm. that you can take and uh, come in with the Holy Spirit to uh, open uh, more to you. Amen. Wow. Awesome. I think we've done excellently today. Let's put our hands together for the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you children for those questions and we thank the Lord for the answers and we pray that the Lord will help us to make informed decisions in Jesus mighty name. Father we thank you. Lord, we bless you. We adore you. Thank you, even for this time, O oh God. Thank you for the questions in the hearts of our children. Thank you that you don't take them for granted, and neither do we, O oh God. 
Thank you, Lord, for the grace even to answer them today. Father, we pray, Lord Almighty, that you will expound the answers even into the life of each child as it affects them, O oh God. Lord, let your name be glorified and let every one of us be blessed. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the 